we're now going to look at some practice problems. So the first thing that we're going to look at is how do we take a given problem and put it into a standard form like a multiplicative uncertainty or an additive uncertainty. So how, do, how would we do that kind of thing? So here's an example. I have a plant and I have k times some transfer function. This is k. Uh, p is some transfer function and k is unknown. But it's not entirely unknown. We just, it, we just know it's between the values k1 and k2. And so the, the question is, how do we put this into one of the standard forms? Now, I'll give you a hint. This thing is multiplying this thing. That kind of gives you the hint that we're going to be dealing with a multiplicative type uncertainty. Okay, so, so that's what we have. So in terms of first quantifying what's going on with our uncertainty, we compute the average of the two values. So that's alpha is the average. Okay, and so... If we look at the timeline between K1 and K2, we have alpha right in the middle, right? And then next we look at the, the difference. How far, how far are we going from one side to the other? So that's given by this quantity, K2 minus K1 divided by 2. Okay, so that's, that's this difference. And so we can write K this way. It's equal to alpha plus K2 minus K1 divided by 2 times delta, where delta is some number between uh, of magnitude less than or equal to 1. That is between minus 1 and 1. So notice that if delta is, for example, minus 1, then the, all of this gives me k1. If delta is positive 1, then all of this gives me k2. So here we have been able to rewrite k in, term, in terms of a nominal value and then uncertainty. And then we have a weighting times the uncertainty. Okay, so I can write it this way. I can also factor out alpha. Okay, so when I factor out alpha, this is what I get. Okay, and I'm going to define beta this way as the difference between this quantity and alpha, and that actually gives me this. And I can go through and show that P of S then can be written this way. Alpha times P1 of S times the quantity 1 plus beta times delta. Okay, so, so basically beta is this quantity right here. Okay, so in case you're wondering, it's like, why did you do that? It's because it's, it's what happens when I factor out alpha. Okay, so k is equal to alpha times this. So k is equal to alpha times this. And so here I have alpha p1. 1 plus beta. Okay, so in case you're wondering, like, magic, how did that thing happen? It didn't just happen by magic. We actually had to massage the thing until we got it down into this form. So the de delta is less than or equal to 1. Okay, so now I'm going to define P0 as alpha P1. I'm going to define W as beta. Okay, and so all of this is what we have. We can now show that p of s is given by this expression okay and so this is what we have and so notice we have one plus w delta and so that's exactly this form okay so this is the original form we had at p1 and we had an uncertain k and we can cast it this way as p naught and our uncertainty this way and so we know what w is we know what p naught is and so we have it in the uh, standard form of multiplicative uncertainty and and notice that I have it written out this way it's at this this uncertainty is actually equivalent if if since we're working with a scalar quantity for these two to be inter interchanged that is I could have the other multiplicative uncertainty term okay so the, so that's what we have so this is the first example this allows us to take a, an uncertain gain not, not a completely uncertain but not not known and to recast it into uh, an uncertain model like this. Second example, we now have, so that one was simple in that our uncertainty was just a constant, okay? It was an a constant uncertainty. In, in this case now, we have an, <clears throat> an uncertain time delay. So a time delay uh, actually corresponds to an infinite dimensional system. 
So e to the minus tau ds corresponds to a time delay in the Laplace domain. So that's equal to, remember, because we have a negative exponent, we have 1 over e to the tau ds. But if you think of tau, uh, e to the tau ds, if you write, you can write that as a power series in S. And as you see, you get an infinite number of terms, which basically corresponds to something like an infinite number of poles. So this quantity actually has something like an infinite number. Of, so it's not, it's not just an tr unknown transfer function. It's actually a transfer function with an infinite number of poles. So this is a fairly, uh, time delays can be fairly complicated things to deal with. So our time delay is not completely unknown. It's between 0 and some maximum value t1. Okay, So we, we know that it's in here somewhere. We don't know exactly what it is. And so it's very common, if you have an uncertainty like this, to not know it exactly, but to have a rough idea. And this is kind of our rough idea. So I'm going to define this quantity, del, as p minus p0 divided by p0. So this is like a percent difference so we're we're, multi, we're taking the difference and subtract dividing by the, the nominal okay and so in this case the magnitude of del at j omega is given by this expression so notice that p naught appears all throughout here and and so it cancels so that's part of the that's part of the reason we use this uh consideration for uh looking at the uncertainty is that it ends up canceling the transfer function portion and only leaves us something that involves the um, the uncertainty so this involves our uncertainty tau d is uncertain and so we now need to investigate how does this quantity uh, how do we how do we find the for example the weighting function that works with this quantity here so if you look at this quantity, 1 minus delta in terms of frequency, 1 minus e to the j tau d omega. This is a function of omega. If we evaluate this over frequencies, um, so for a specific value of tau d, this is what the response looks like as a function of omega. Okay, That's what, that's what this quant quantity looks like. So we can get like a Bode plot of it. And so this... Uh, pinkish area, uh, salmon color, I don't know, um, basically corresponds to what happens as we vary, um, as we vary tau d from 0 to um, tau 1. And so I can get, this, this transfer function can take on any value in this region, this pinkish region. Okay, so, so the purple is an example for some particular value of tau d, that's what we would get. So, but since tau d can be anything between 0 and tau 1, then we have this. So it turns out that this pink condition we can actually describe analytically. So that's L subscript m is this expression. So this exactly describes that pink area. Okay, so the first part covers up to this point here and then the rest covers it out from there. So that's why we have it broken up into two parts, up to pi over tau 1 and uh, above pi over tau 1. So this L is an upper bound on the uncertainty. That's that pinkish region. And so we can go through and show that, in fact, L is greater than or equal to this quantity for all omega. Okay, so this is an upper bound, and that's the kind of thing we want to use as our weighting function. However, this as a function is not a transfer function. Okay, so this black line then is L of M. So we're going to choose instead this weighting function. This is a first order transfer function. Notice it includes alpha. It includes uh, some value alpha. We don't know what to choose for alpha yet. And then notice it has this pole uh, over 2 over pi tau, tau 1. And we can go through and show that this quantity has magnitude greater than or equal to that L, the upper bound, for all frequencies. 
And again, the question is, why don't, why don't we just choose these equal? It's because L does not give us an actual transfer function. We need a transfer function because that's going to become like part of our block diagram, right, uh, as a transfer function. So um, it is a function of omega, but it's not a transfer function. So we want to use a transfer function. So if you look, for example, at omega, um, at what happens when we use um, this function. So bl the blue is W, the red is L. And so you can see that W is in fact greater than, greater than or equal to, um, um, L. Here, alpha is 1.2, and you can see it's well above. It's it's definitely above. And so I could actually reduce alpha, and that would actually make the blue close to the red, closer to the red. But this just kind of gives you an idea that, of what we would choose for W for our weighting function. Okay, so in terms of our block diagram, then this is how our block diagrams diagram is going to look. Again, the e to the j tau d s was multiplying our plant, and so we can expect again a multiplicative uncertainty out of this. We've just come up with a weighting function, and so uh, this is what we call del, and so um, this gives us the uncertainty. So we have been able to take this uncertain time delay problem and be able to get a, a um, model, a W and a delta. So again, at this point now, if we have a controller for the system, we could go through and analyze the system to determine whether it's stable. That's example number two. Example number three, I have this state model. So this M has this state model. And our uncertainty set, so I have M and delta, our uncertainty set is diagonal. We want to determine if this system is robustly stable. So in this case, because our, our delta is diagonal, we cannot use uh, the singular value. That is, we can't use the H infinity norm of M. We actually have to use the structured singular value. So we need to take this system and compute the structured singular value for it. In this case, and this is the transfer function. Once, once we take this state model and convert it to a transfer function, this is the transfer function we get. This one just happens to, yeah, yeah, just happens, right? Um, just happens to be factorable into this form. So actually, it doesn't just happen. I made it happen. Um, I mean, I picked an example so that this would happen. Actually, I started here is what I started with. And um, so we have this function. And so all of this, I have a column times a row. That's a rank one matrix. And so if you recall, back when we looked at the structured singular value, the structured singular value was a, um, for a rank one matrix, was one of the few situations where we could actually calculate the structured singular value. So given this formula, we can, we can go back and use the results for mu on rank one matrices. And so we can go through and show that this, in fact, is mu as a function of omega. And so we get this expression. So at each value of omega, we get a different mu value. And we can now plot this mu as a function of omega in a, in a Bode plot. So as we plot it, this is what we get. So it does this, and it peaks here. And we see that the peak value is less than 1. So this is not in dB here. This is just in magnitude. And I can see that the magnitude is less than 1. So structured singular value plot. We can also use the MATLAB command SSV to compute the structured singular value. So this is what we have. So the, the mu, the structured singular value for this problem, is strictly less than 1. If we were to take our system and actually compute the infinity norm, that's equal, equal to 1.3, which is strictly greater than 1. So if we had used this M to assess the stability of the system, we would conclude that the closed loop system is not robustly stable. However, because we know that our uncertainty is diagonal um, and mu is strictly less than 1, then we know that our system is robustly stable, even though the infinity norm wouldn't have indicated that to us.
All right, next example. This is an example in, uh, in discrete time. Okay, so, and I haven't given a sampling time here. If you're not given a sampling time, you can always supply a sampling time of say, t is equal to one or 0.1 or whatever. It turns out that the sampling time actually uh, matters in terms of the time response. It doesn't matter in terms of stability. Okay, so, um, so it just, just the Z transform uh, matters. So notice I have an uncertain value here, A. I want to determine the range for which the system, range of A for which the system is robustly stable for all uncertainties. Okay, in this case, we need the infinity norm of the system. So, but our, our, our quantity here includes an uncertainty. So we don't know specifically. So, but in this case, actually, we can solve this by a couple of ways. One way is to take that A out and work with what's left and, and compute the H infinity norm of what's left. Um, or in this case, I've done a Bode plot and I can find that the peak value is 4.954. So in, in terms of dB, it's 13.9 dB. Okay, so I'm actually plotting M divided by A. So that takes the A out. So in order for this system to have infinity norm less, strictly less than one, I need A to be strictly less than one over this value, which is this. So that's the value of A I need. So for any A that is strictly less than say 0.2, I'm good. My system should be robustly stable. Okay, now we're given this system and this uncertainty set, and we're asked to compute if the system is robustly stable. In this case, this system does not boil down to, into that nice uh, sy simple system. In fact, this is a multi-input, multi-output system. Two input, two output system. Okay, so this system is not going to give us give us that nice um, that nice um, you know column times a row. It's not going to do that. So we can't use that simple tool. So how then do we compute the structured singular value for this? Well, you can do it the long way, which is analytically, or you can do it in MATLAB. So I'm going to show how to do this in MATLAB, and I actually alluded to this in the other example. So here's my MATLAB code. I've defined my ABCD matrices, and then I defined uh, a set of frequencies over which I want to evaluate the structured singular value. And then I can use this command, SSV of ABCD and W. And so this takes the system that has the values of ABCD, it evaluates them at the frequencies omega, and it computes the mu. It doesn't return a plot, so I go, went ahead and plotted it here. So notice I used semi-log x to give me a log scale here, and I used, uh, so semi-log x means this axis is logarithmic, this one is not logarithmic, okay? So the reason I do that is because, um, um, I have a lot of, I have a lo large range of frequencies. So log space minus two to two says, I'm going to pick something 10 to the minus two out to 10 to the two. So if you were just to plot this, this would be really compressed because this is going out to a hundred, whereas this is the value basically one. And so the, the plot gets very compressed in the frequency axis this way. So that's why we use a log scale for frequency. Um, but in, the, in this case, we're just looking at the structured singular value. And I can see now that my structured singular value plot shows me magnitude 1.7 maximum, which is uh, strictly greater than 1. That tells me that our system is not robustly stable in, the, in, in, in this case. So we can evaluate that. So these are some practical tools. Thanks again for watching.